Good afternoon, Solorians and guests. Uh, today, our speaker is Michael, Michael Riedel, a New York Post columnist, uh, author, longtime commentator on national arts and politics, especially on WOR every morning. Uh, we especially appreciate Michael joining us today since he's already done a day's work uh, hosting the, the daily WR radio show with Len Berman, which I listened to this morning. Uh, to give Michael a proper introduction, uh, here is Solarian's board member and longtime television personality, Tony Guy. He graduated magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from Columbia. He's been covering Broadway for the Post for 23 years. His columns are often witty, always dishy, sometimes vitriolic, and they have made him notorious among Broadway producers and actors. But the one and only Elaine Stritch said of Michael Riedel, quote, I'm unusual. Most people fear him. I like him. We like the fact that Michael has come from his radio show, WOR, this morning. He and Len Berman every morning, 6 to 10. Uh, he's got a book out called Singular Sensation. Uh, here's Michael. Hey, thank you very much. Um, yeah, Elaine Stritch, uh, she was a she was a good uh, good friend of mine. Uh, I remember once I took her out to dinner because uh, you always took Elaine out because she never paid for anything. And um, I was meeting her down here in the village where I live on Perry Street at uh, the Perry Street restaurant, which is just across the street from me. And Elaine, back in those days, uh, she walked everywhere. That was her exercise. And she lived up at the Carlisle Hotel on the Upper East Side. And she walked down from the uh, Carlisle Hotel. And as I was going across the street to go to the restaurant, there was Elaine walking down Perry Street, trailed by 10 gay guys that she just collected on her way down from the Carlisle Hotel. And she was telling them stories about being in company and telling them stories about Sondheim. And these guys, they were like puppy dogs. I mean, they, they were just behind her, just lapping up every single thing she said. And then I said, Elaine, I, I made a reservation for the two of us. I didn't think there'd be 10 of us. And she turned to the guys when we got to the door and she said, boys, vamoose. And that was the end of it. But, but that was Elaine. She was a terrific, uh, terrific character. In fact, she's in this book, Singular Sensation, uh, The Triumph of Broadway, because uh, the book is about Broadway in the, uh, in the 1990s, uh, which was a very, um, very big decade for Broadway then. Really, that's when the theater went from being kind of the backwater of the entertainment business to uh, the multi-billion dollar empire that it is today. And you had shows such as Rent, Chicago, the Lion King, the producers. I mean, all these shows that were as famous in their day as any TV series or movie was at the time. But my favorite chapter in the book, and this is where Elaine comes into play. My favorite chapter, the one I enjoyed writing the most, the one I think I took the most care with, was uh, my chapter on the return of Edward Albee. Because Edward, I met when I was a kid in college. He was, uh, he was in the wilderness then. Uh, nobody would produce an Edward Albee play. He'd had a play called The Man Who Had Three Arms on Broadway in 1983 that Frank Rich called A Rant in Three Acts. And he said, uh, it's such a pity that one of the most talented playwrights has now become this hack like Edward Albee. And so his career was down and out for the count. And I got to know him uh, when he was teaching up at uh, Columbia one semester. And I, I wasn't really a theater kid, but I was in love with this girl who was an actress and she took the class. And so whatever class she took, I took so I could follow her around. And Edward and I became friends way back in those days. And he was a very interesting character, Edward. Again, he was totally frozen out of the theater business. Nobody would take a chance on an Edward Albee play. And then I remember seeing him for a coffee one day and he said, I have a new play. He was, Edward spoke like this. I have a new play. Would you care to read it? I said, oh, yeah, sure. Sure, I'd be happy to. So out of this old satchel he had, he took this manuscript and he gave it to me. And the play was Three Tall Women. And that was the play that brought Edward Albee back. It won the Pulitzer Prize. It was uh, a remarkable, remarkable play. And Edward then never looked back. After Three Tall Women, then you had the brilliant revival that Lincoln Center did of A Delicate Balance, starring Elaine Stritch and George Grizzard and Rosemary, Rosemary Harris, I think, was in it, yeah. And as I write about Edward's comeback, um, 
Elaine was, she gave a brilliant performance in this play, A Delicate Balance, but she was the biggest pain in the ass to work with. And she would do things like, she would, um, just before the curtain went up, she'd come running out of the stage door in her panties, running over to the box office to make sure the box office treasurers were not stealing her house seats. And she'd be wearing nothing but her panties while people were going in to see her in this play. George Grizzard hated her, absolutely hated her, because Elaine made everything about Elaine. And one night, and Andre Bishop told me the story, he was the uh, head of Lincoln Center, still is. Andre said, one night, the curtain came down and George punched Elaine in the face. Elaine ran to her dressing room. She got her curling iron and she chased George around the backstage area trying to hit him with the curling iron. And as Andre said to me, he said, the only time you were safe in that theater, I believe it was at the, the booth, if I'm not mistaken. He said, the only time you were safe was when the curtain went up. And he said, and then you saw three amazing actors give three of the most brilliant performances you will ever see in your life. But he said, man, when that curtain came down, it was a danger zone backstage with the seething hatred. And I asked, um, I asked Andre, I said, well, what did, what did Edward think about this? He said, well, Edward didn't care. He was just happy that he had another success on Broadway, a delicate balance. He could have cared less what was going on backstage. He would just come count the house, cash his check, and that was it. So, um, but it was a great, uh, great joy for me to write that chapter on Edward always coming back. And, and he never faltered. He really never, uh, never faltered after Three Tall Women. There was, you know, great revivals of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And sadly, there was going to be a, another revival of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf on Broadway before the pandemic, which is going to be produced by one Scott Rudin, who's now been canceled. I'm sure you all know the big Broadway producer who got in trouble for bullying his assistants. So Scott has had to withdraw from the field. But uh, but Elaine, yeah, she, she was great. So yeah, so this book, Singular Sensation, the t uh, subtitle is ironic, The Triumph of Broadway, because it takes place in the 90s. And the last part of the book is about September 11th and about Broadway's really remarkable comeback when uh, Rudy Giuliani went to all the producers on September 12th and said, when can you reopen Broadway? And they're like, well, I mean, how are we gonna reopen? You know, our guys, they live in New Jersey, they live in the suburbs, no one can get into the city. And Giuliani said, look, I want to tell the world that New York City is back in business. And the best way to do that is to have the lights of Broadway lit. And he said, I want you guys up on Thursday, September 13th. And it's impossible. He said, I don't, I don't want to hear impossible. You're going to do it. And indeed they did. And I went with uh, Mel Brooks and Ann Bancroft to see the producers that night, Thursday, September 13th, 2001. I'll never forget it. And the house was uh, maybe three quarters full. And uh, it, in the beginning, people didn't know whether to laugh or not. It was an uneasy situation. But, you know, with Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick, sooner or later, you're going you're gonna to start laughing. And the only change that they made, Matthew Broderick told me this for the book. He said the only thing that they were told before they went on was, we're not going to have the sound effects of the bombs going off in springtime for Hitler because you didn't want to just didn't want to hear a bomb September 13th because of the fear that we all had about what could happen anywhere in the city then. And at the end of the show, I remember uh, Matthew and Nathan led all of us, including me and Ann and Mel, uh, singing God Bless America at the curtain call in tears. So I ended the book with you know, the recovery of Broadway after September 11th, and that's why I called it Singular Sensation, The Triumph of Broadway. Uh, finished the book February 2020, took myself on a little uh, ski vacation to celebrate finishing the book. I was in Switzerland. One day I skied into Italy, a beautiful day, uh, had a great lunch at a restaurant there and I had a glass of wine and I took a picture of the wine with a Matterhorn in the background. I sent it to my fiance and she said, where are you? I said, I'm in Italy. Italy. She said, do you know what's going on? I said, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> skiing. I mean, how would I, I'm not watching CNN. She said, there's this thing, the coronavirus and it's spiking all over Northern Italy. What are you doing? Well, I'm skiing, but you know, two days later, they shut down the resort I was in with the coronavirus. I got out on the last flight from Zurich back to New York. Friends of mine wound up being stuck in uh, Switzerland until June. They couldn't get out. And I got back here and, you know, my book is done. And I called my editor and I said, um, I got a problem. The triumph of Broadway. And now they've shut Broadway down. We don't know how long it's going to be shut down for with the pan pandemic. And my editor is a good guy, Ben Lunin at Simon & Schuster. He said, look, your book is a 
piece of history. It's about Broadway in the 90s. Just ran, just write a uh, forward, putting things in context of COVID, but then tell the story that you're going to tell of the rise of Broadway in the uh, 1990s. So, you know, the, 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 the sad thing for me, and I'm glad that Broadway is coming back, but it's going to be slow. But Broadway has never gone through anything like this pandemic. Uh, and I was thinking about with September 11th, people wanted to go to the theater because people wanted to be together. They wanted to be together after that attack on the World Trade Center. The problem with the pandemic is you couldn't be together. For all these 18 months, none of us could be together. And that is the most devastating thing for the arts because the arts depend on people coming together. 1,500 people sitting in an old theater every night on top of each other, practically. And uh, I think we're still, we're not out of the woods yet, whereas as far as Broadway is concerned, uh, ticket sales are okay for some shows, not so good for other shows. And people are still, I think, a little scared and reluctant to go back to Broadway. But uh, I do believe, having written two books about Broadway, uh, the first one covering sort of the history of Broadway from the uh, 50s through the 80s, Broadway is survives. You know, it survived the Depression, it survived television, it survived the movies, it survived September 11th, and somehow it will su survive the pandemic. And um, it survives because, because of all the colorful, fun people in this book who, uh, you know, spent a lot of time with me. I interviewed over 200 people for this book. And just people like um, Fran and Barry Weisler, who they saw... They saw this show that was only supposed to be a four performance only concert version of an old show called Chicago that no one had remembered. And um, Fran and Barry loved it. And they called Fred Ebb uh, the morning after they saw the show. And they said, uh, Fred, if you could just give us a little piece of Chicago, just a little piece of it, we'd be so grateful. And Fred said, Fran, you can have the whole thing. Nobody's called. Because nobody thought back in the mid 90s that a show uh, with a band on stage and people only wearing a tuxedo or black dresses, nobody thought it would sell because everybody thought, well, you need a chandelier, you need a helicopter, you need all the special effects of all the big British spectacles. No one is going to pay at that time the princely sum of $85 to see a show where there are no special effects. And Fran and Barry, as I tell a story in this book, they couldn't raise the uh, they couldn't raise the money to put Chicago on. They could not raise the money. Their bankers wouldn't give them the money. Their old investors wouldn't give them the money. Everybody said, "Fran, it's an old show. Nobody cares about it. Nobody remembers it. And there's no falling chandelier. We don't care." And Fran and Barry, one night they got they got into bed and uh, they decided that they would do the show pretty much on their own. And they had 80% of Chicago. And Fran told me, as I put in the book, she said, "I pulled the covers over my head. And said, oh my God." What have we done? Well, Chicago, before the pandemic, ran 22 years, 18 productions around the world, a worldwide wide gross of $3 billion. And Fran and Barry Weisler have 80% of it because nobody else wanted to invest in Chicago. And that's kind of the joy for me about writing about Broadway is because the, the things you think are going to look great, on paper, they look great. Um, and they turned out to be the biggest fiascos. I remember being told Julie Taymor is gonna be directing a musical based on Spider-Man with music by Bono and The Edge. Cannot miss, absolute hit from start to finish. Biggest disaster I ever saw on Broadway, lost $100 million. But you take a kid, no one had ever heard of before in uh, 1990, and he has this idea to do a musical, an updating of uh, Puccini's La Boheme. The kid has no track record anywhere. He's had a couple of little off-Broadway shows. Nobody paid any attention to it. And he's working on the show, working on the show. And he calls it Rent because um, it's about people who can't pay their rent because he could not pay his rent back in those days. But also about young people who are dying of AIDS back then, battling drug issues. So rent had a double meaning. Rent is, and I can't pay the rent, but also rent your life being rent apart as his was because so many of his friends were dying. They were dying of AIDS. They, they were heroin addicts. He lived in that real bohemian world. And uh, I opened the book, uh, early chapters about rent and Jonathan Larson. He's the one who wrote it. And it's funny, you know, I was reliving those days. I, I, I covered that show. And I remember getting a call from the press agent, Richard Kornberg, 
And he said, oh, Michael, I have some sad news. I said, well, he said, you know, Jonathan Larson died last night. And, you know, he has this new show opening off Broadway called Rent. I was at the Daily News and I said, well, I'm sorry, Richard, but I mean, I really can't write much about it. No one's ever heard of the kid or no one's ever heard of the show. He said, come to see it tonight. So I went downtown to the New York Theater Workshop and I saw Rent the day after Jonathan Larson died. And right then and there, you knew the musical theater was going to be changed forever. And the musical theater survives to this day. Lin-Manuel Miranda, Bobby Lopez, who did the Book of Mormon and um, uh, the, uh, uh, Pasek and Paul, who did Dear Evan Hansen. They're only on Broadway because as kids, they saw Rent. Bobby Lopez saw Rent 30 times. Lin-Manuel Miranda saw Rent 40 times. Jonathan Larson, without even realizing, without knowing it, because he didn't live to see it, he died. He died the, the night of his dress rehearsal. He did not live to see that the musical theater that he wanted to save, because he felt a lot of the shows back then were not in touch with his generation. He wrote a show that brought a whole new generation of young artists, actors, designers, composers, writers, all around Broadway today because of Rent. And, you know, poor Jonathan, he, he was not feeling, very, uh, not feeling very well toward the end of the rehearsal process of Rent. And he went to the emergency room a couple of times. Once they diagnosed food poisoning, the other time they diagnosed uh, the flu. And uh, after uh, the dress rehearsal of Rent, he met with Anthony Tomasini, who was the opera critic for the New York Times. And Anthony was interviewing Jonathan. Not interestingly enough about Rent, because remember, we didn't know what Rent was. Anthony was doing a piece on the 100th anniversary of uh, La Boheme. And in that piece, he was going to slot in. And by the way, there's this new little show by this kid called Jonathan Larson called Rent based on Bohem at some little off-Broadway theater. You've never heard it before. And Jonathan finished that interview with Anthony Tomasini, went back to his apartment, 508 Greenwich. It's a chapter in my book. I call it 508 Greenwich. The apartment building is just down the street. And went upstairs around two in the morning, put on the tea kettle to make some tea and dropped dead on his kitchen floor because what all the doctors had failed to see was this um he had a a tear in his heart it was an aneurysm in the heart and it just ripped open and killed him before he hit the ground and he was found by his roommate at four o'clock in the morning and then you know rent became the sensation that it was but uh it's it is the most poignant chapter i i feel in my book about jonathan's struggle to get that show on and then not to live to see the profound impact that it had on so many, the, the new generation of kids all over the world who want to be in the theater. And they're all there because of Rent. So so Chicago, Rent, The Lion King, just uh, among the many stories I tell in this book, singular sensation, The Triumph of Broadway. <laughs> I'd like to start by asking you um, about, you know, the headlines. Broadway is back and all of the hoopla and the big ad that they've been doing on television or they had for a while with Oprah Winfrey uh, involved. But is Broadway really back? Who's in the audience for these shows? Uh, it's probably not the tourists that Broadway depends on. How do you, how do you see this partial opening and how do you project how long it's going to take for Broadway to really be back? And I thank David Kirschenbaum for uh, much of that question. You have the initial excitement of the theater reopening. So you have New Yorkers who are not afraid to go to the theater, going to see things. Um, and you're getting a lot of publicity because of that. But that is a, a very um, finite number of people. Broadway, and this is the... Um, the double-edged sword for Broadway, it made a ton of money on the tourists, but the tourists are not here and they're not gonna come back for a while. I think that once you get past the, um, all the hoopla and the publicity of the show's opening, when you get into the cold winter months, uh, there's going to be a real reckoning for a lot of these shows. Uh, if you're a show like The Phantom of the Opera and you've been running 30, 33 years, most of your audience is coming from South America and they're not gonna be here. And I don't know, how many New Yorkers out there who have not seen The Phantom of the Opera who are going to rush back to see The Phantom of the Opera? I would actually rather be a new show, something like Six, that you haven't seen before, which is a fun show, um, than I would one of the older shows that have been around a while. And I, I know, as much as I love Chicago, I know um, 
they're they're worried. They're worried. They look ahead to their ticket sales, and there are not a lot of tickets being sold to a lot of these shows going into January, February, and March. And you know the problem is these shows are very expensive to run, and the and the unions, by the way, did not give any of the producers any kind of breaks. The unions' attitude was, look, we've all been out of work for eighteen months. We're not cutting you any any breaks. We need to make money too. But at the end of the day, if you're not um, if you're not keeping your head above water, you start losing 100,000 this week, 200,000 the next week, 250,000 the week after that. It doesn't take a genius to think we got to shut down. My guess, and I was talking to a very shrewd Broadway producer I know who knows all the numbers and has been looking at everything. He said, when it all comes, when it's all said and done into January and February, he said, there will be about 14 shows left on Broadway out of 35 now. There will only be 14 will be left. Have you been to a show yet, Mike? Yeah, I went to six on Friday, the musical about the wives of Henry VIII. It's bubblegum. It's it's total uh, uh, pop rock kind of thing, but great fun. It's great fun. Tremendous fun. And uh, the audience loved it. And I think I think that show is going to be one of the ones that survives because it's new, it's fresh, great new cast, uh, young people who wrote it. There's a lot of energy to it. So I think I, if I were a producer now, I'd rather have the new show that people haven't seen before than the old show where I've been living on tourism for the last five to 10 years, because the tourists are not coming back anytime soon. In line with what you just said, company, uh, which had great uh, notices in London before the pandemic shut it down with Patty Lapone in it and uh, uh, where they changed the, uh, the sex of the lead character, Bob, uh, Bobby. Uh, company is supposedly coming uh, back well, not back, but supposedly opening on Broadway in in November. Uh, have you had any conversation? I mean, that's one of the new shows that folks would be able to see if they so desire. Have you had any com- uh, conversation with with producers of that show? And how yeah, they're-, they're, they're optimistic. They were selling very well. And, you know, listen, Patty Lapone, I mean, you know, she's as durable as the Empire State Building, or the Statue of Liberty. She is a New York icon. So New Yorkers will go to see Patty Lapone. But an interesting story happened. Um, Patty called me the morning of March 11th, 2020. And she said, you know what's going on. Tell, tell, tell me what's happening. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, Cynthia Nixon was at the show last night. And Cynthia Nixon came backstage and she said, I wanted to see the show because I knew it was the last time I was going to have some fun for a while because we're going to be locked down. And Patty said, what, lock, what do you mean lockdown? What's a lockdown? She said, you know, the governor is going to close everything down. And Patty just, you couldn't wrap your mind around that. What, what do you mean, going to shut, shut things down? Are you kidding me? She called me. She said, you're in the know. What's going on with this lockdown? I said, Patty, I don't know, but I know that today they're all meeting. There's a big meeting of all the Broadway producers. I think your producer is there. And I think they're waiting to find out what the governor's going to do. And it was that afternoon Cuomo announced that all restaurants, all bars, all Broadway shows, movie theaters, everything was going to be shut down. And um, that night, a bunch of my producer friends, <laughs> they invited me to go with them, but I, I didn't because I had to get up to do the morning show. So I was not going to go out drinking at Sardi's. They all went to Sardi's, the second floor bar at Sardi's to kind of commiserate. They all got COVID. Everyone in that bar that night came down with COVID. They all survived, fortunately, but they all got really, really sick. But yeah, but I think company's going to come back and it's going to be fun. Patty's terrific in it. And uh, it's company's a great, great show. And this is kind of a fun new twist and version on it. For a, a, a thing, I went I went on Ticketmaster uh, I, last night and uh, I, I picked Hamilton. Maybe that wasn't a good uh, a choice since that's a, a super duper blockbuster. You know, everybody wants to see it more than once and. And here's what Ticketmaster had to say about ticket prices. For this Friday night, there were orchestra seats in good rows, row E, H, and K for 399 bucks. Yeah, that tells you. Tells you everything. And then I just decided to pick Thanksgiving weekend. So for Friday, November 26th, orchestra seats, uh, rows D and E, 700 bucks verified resale it said as opposed to the ticketmaster 
ticket prices. What do you make of that? I mean, it, it, uh, our, you, you told me when we talked back in, in February about your book that people uh, who come back now and who come back to Broadway early uh, in the early days are not going to be willing to pay that kind of price. Now, I, I recognize Hamilton is exceptional, but what what, what do you think about those well, prices, what do they tell well, you? That Hamilton ticket price for, you know, 300 bucks, you say that's a steal because before the pandemic, Hamilton was a thousand bucks a ticket for seats in, you know, in row X. So to be able to get a seat at Hamilton in row D or E for 300 bucks, that tells you that they're not, the, the demand is not there. 400. 400, yeah. When you look at Thanksgiving is always going to be a strong week, but these are hopeful prices. They have the ability now on Broadway to reprice things all the time. So if those seats around the Thanksgiving time are not selling, that price is going to come way, way, way down. And I know from talking to my friends who are ticket brokers who buy a lot of these seats and they try to sell them for more money. That's how they make their profit. A lot of them are telling me we're just we're, we're, we're sitting on stacks of seats that we have not sold yet. And they're going to dump those seats. They're going to get their refunds as they can if they turn them in at a certain period of time. And so there, there are going to be a lot of seats flooding the market very soon, trust me. I mean, this is not, you can't reopen this industry without tourism. And there is, there, there are not foreign tourists in this country. They're just, they're not here. And the tourists that are here, I mean, I, I wander around Times Square just to get a sense of the place. There are a lot of people there, but I don't want to sound like a snob here, but they're not people who, for whom Broadway would be something that they would have the money to spend it on. They're taking advantage of cheap airfare, cheap hotels to come to New York to see the Empire State Building, to see the Statue of Liberty. They're not people who are going to pay three, four hundred dollars to uh, to see a Broadway show. You wrote uh, pretty glowingly of the, of the uh, TV commercial, the campaign, this three minute thing, which of course has been broken down into shorter things. And I was interested in, a, in a, something I read about that campaign when they designed it. Uh, the first idea was to aim it at casual theater goers uh, because they felt that the core audience was definitely coming back. And then as the spring and summer advanced and the Delta variant took over, uh, that idea had to be thrown out the window and they aimed that thing at theater goers from around here, New Jersey, Connecticut, people who can come to Broadway fairly easily. Um, is that your understanding? And, and, and how, why were you so uh, effusive about the, about the piece? Uh, they did an early commercial that I didn't like. I thought it was kind of muted, but I have, you have to understand, you know, they couldn't film with a lot of people together because people couldn't be together then. So they had to, you know, make the best of what they had. Um, and then they uh, decided to do this Broadway campaign, which I think is pretty good, sort of celebrating the whole history of Broadway. So they have a lot of clips from the old shows. You know, Angela Lansbury's there. You see something from Sweeney Todd. You see Ben Vereen in the original production of Pippin. Just a kind of reminder of how much fun Broadway has been over these many years. And they're targeting that uh, Northeastern corridor uh, from Washington Boston to Washington, people that they think who want to come to Broadway, who will jump on the Acela, come up to New York for the day, maybe stay over for a night to see a Broadway show, to be out and about again. Uh, and they're targeting those people because those are the only only people really now who are coming to Broadway. I mean, I've, I've talked to my friends over at the League of American Theaters and they're saying, you know, we're looking at the, you know, we get all the data from the tourists where they're coming from. There's nobody coming in from another country. I mean, the Canadians aren't coming and they were huge for Broadway. They're not coming. South Americans, big supporters of Broadway, not coming. Chinese aren't coming. Europeans aren't coming. So you got to go where that audience that is, they hope is willing to come back to New York. And that's going to be that Northeast quarter for the time being. But they, my friends at the league tell me they don't expect foreign tourism to come back for another year. But a year in the life of a Broadway show is, is, could be the end of the show because I don't care how much money you've made on Chicago, you're not going to keep a show open that loses a hundred thousand, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a week. It's just not going to do it. What about off Broadway, um, which does have more of a New York audience? Yeah. What do you What do you see going on there? 
Uh, I, and what have you seen that you like? The only show I've been to recently was six. So I, I'm not, I have not been out and about yet, but I would say off Broadway is off Broadway is in a, in a funny way. It's in a stronger position than Broadway because it's costs are, a fraction of what it costs to do a Broadway show and its audience is New Yorkers. Uh, so if you're a theater, off-Broadway theater on the Lower East Side, you're probably going to appeal to younger people who aren't afraid of the coronavirus, who are anxious to get on with their lives, who are out at bars and restaurants. So if you have some good off-Broadway shows out there, I actually think now is a big opportunity for off-Broadway to um, become important once again in a way it hadn't been for a long time. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, it was Broadway and off-Broadway, but Broadway became so lucrative that everybody opened a show off-Broadway, they wanted to move it to Broadway. That was the goal. So they would start small because we can do it cheaply, but the goal is to move to Broadway. Whereas back in the old off-Broadway days when I covered off-Broadway in the 80s and the 90s, off-Broadway is off-Broadway. They didn't need to move to Broadway. They had their own fine life off-Broadway. And then everybody just got so absorbed with the greed and the money and winning Tony Awards that every off-Broadway show was, we can move to Broadway. It's good, I think, for off-Broadway to go back to its roots, do plays at reasonable prices where the tickets aren't wildly expensive or you're not paying all those crazy union fees. Be experimental. Try something new and different. You really have nothing to lose right now. What you want to do is to have something that's going to bring a young audience in. And let's face it, older people are a little more reluctant to go to a theater right now with the Delta variant, whereas younger people, I mean, I live in the West Village here, the kids are out and about all the time. I mean, they've been carrying on since last summer as if there were no coronavirus. They don't care, they're going out with their lives. So if I were an off-Broadway producer, I would find a really exciting new show by a young playwright and go right after that young 20 to 30 year old crowd. They can come in for a ticket price of 65 or 70 bucks and uh, off-Broadway could in fact be, um, could be uh, very vibrant again. Myron Roshetsky has a question uh, for you, Michael, asking, have you ever seen a show or a performance in a show or both that left you speechless? Yeah, two come to mind. Um, uh, I saw Long Day's Journey Into Night with Brian Dennehy and Vanessa Redgrave. And I was very, uh, very close to Brian. Sadly, he's no longer with us. And I remember um, the night before I went to see that performance, I had dinner with Brian at Joe Allen. And he said, you're not going to believe what, you, what you're going to see with Vanessa Redgrave. He said, she's the craziest person I have ever worked with. She is a total eccentric. But he said, I thought I knew this play. And Brian had done it in Chicago the year before. And he said, you know, I thought I knew this play backwards and forwards. I knew all my lines, know everything about Eugene O'Neill. I thought there's going to be easy, easy money on Broadway. And he said, from the very first rehearsal with Vanessa, he said, I had to throw everything out of my mind, what I thought about the player, the character, because she was doing stuff that I could not even have imagined. And he said, trust me, you will see that too. And I went to see that performance the next day and Usually I can see the acting, I can admire the actor, but I can see the mechanics of the acting. Vanessa Redgrave was Mary Tyrone. And if you guys know the play, you know, she's the, she's the morphine addicted mother. And uh, you never know, the family never knows what she's gonna be like from day to day. And that was Vanessa. I mean, there was no acting. She was Mary Tyrone. And later on, I went backstage to see Brian and he said, Every night she does something different. Sometimes she enters from the root cellar. Sometimes she enters from the porch. Sometimes she enters from the attic. He said, you have no idea what she is going to do that night. And he said, and that's exactly what the play is about. This whole family is on edge because they do not know what Mary Tyrone is going to be like that day. And that's what Vanessa brought to that. And I saw the play three or four times and every performance of Vanessa's was different. You just did not know what was going to happen. And it kept you on edge. And Brian, Brian, who was a very old fashioned, here's the blocking, here's the lines, you do it the same way every night, eight performances a week, that's it. He loved every minute of it. He said, I've never, ever had to have been on top of everything as I was with Vanessa, because it always was shifting all the time. So that was the great 
great performance I saw. And, and by the way, Brian was sensational in that play too. The great theater, uh, musical theater performance for me was, I went to see a very early preview of The Lion King in Minneapolis when I was trying, uh, trying out before coming to Broadway. Uh, I remember it was 1997 or 98 because I remember I landed and I turned on CNN and they were reporting that there had been a car crash in France and Princess Diana was in the car. I just remember that 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 moment. Anyway, I went out to the Minneapolis to see The Lion King and I was prepared to kill it because I did not like uh, Disney. I hated Beauty and the Beast. I was definitely in the uh, category of the snobby critics who thought uh, Disney's going to turn Times Square into a theme park as we were saying back in those days. And I knew Julie Taymor and I knew her work uh, from the avant-garde world and from the opera, but I couldn't put together this family friendly company that's doing these theme park puppet shows with this avant-garde director, Julie Taymor. I thought this is the recipe for a complete and total catastrophe. And so I went to see a matinee, I guess I think it was a Wednesday matinee I went, if I, maybe it was a Saturday matinee. Um, but I went really prepared to destroy the whole thing. I mean, I was really ready to kill it. And I was frankly looking forward to killing it because, you know, in my <laughs> profession, the meaner you are, the more money you get paid. And I was prepared to kill this thing. And I just remember sitting there, you know, Minneapolis, Orpheum Theater, Disney, Julie Taymor, this doesn't work together. This is not going to work. And um, that opening number, The Circle of Life, Elton John, Tim Rice's song, I remember uh, C.D. LaLoca, she was playing Rafiki, the, um, the shaman in it. And she comes out and she's singing, they're doing the South African calls and the real South African actors there that Julie cast are singing South African chants. And then this beautiful, just very simple paper mache, big sun came rising up. It was, be it was beautiful. I mean, I, I, I remember like, I mean, like this ready to kill. And I thought, wow, that's, that looks good. And I just remember kind of going down like this. And then the cheetah puppet came walking out and then the giraffe puppets came loping out from stage left. And all of a sudden the parade of the animals, all the people as puppets. And I was completely stunned at what I was seeing. I'd never, I'd never seen anything like it. And I remember something brushed past me. I was on the aisle and I looked at him as the life-size elephant puppet walking down the aisle. And by the end of that number, the circle of life, when um, they hold up the baby Simba, boom, blackout. I have never in my life, in all the years I've been going to the theater, heard an audience lose their minds. They went completely nuts. And people, they were not only standing up to cheer it, they were standing on their seats to cheer it. And to my great shame as a cynical critic, I was one of those people on my feet, applauding, cheering, and screaming. And at the end of, at the end of that preview of The Lion King, I had to interview Julie Taymor, Peter Schneider and Tom Schumacher, Peter and Tom were then running Disney theatrical. They were the producers of The Lion King. And I remember meeting them on the, the roof of the theater where there was a bar and a restaurant. And I remember Peter saying to me, he said, do you think we're gonna be okay? And I said, I think you guys have the biggest hit since the Phantom of the Opera. And they, they didn't know because they'd been living with it for so long. They'd been in rehearsals, they'd been in technical rehearsals where nothing worked. They had no idea what they had. And, you know, years later, The Lion King, before the pandemic, its worldwide gross stood at $9 billion. It is the most successful entertainment property in the history of entertainment. It has made more money than E.T. and Star Wars because it cost Disney only $20 million. And its worldwide gross is now $9 billion. Michael, Joe Berger wants to know how you uh, chose theater. How did you get into theater as a career? By the way, is this the great Joe Berger who covered all of those fabulous scandals of the Schubert organization back in the day, whose reporting I used extensively in my first book, Razzle Dazzle, about the Schuberts trying to deep six the, the second family and the kids? Is that is that that, that Joe Berger? Because his, his stuff was great. I, I'm pretty yes, sure it is, Joe. Where are you? I got to thank you. I could not have written my first book without all of those great stories you wrote uh, for the New York Post about the whole Schubert scandal back in the... Uh, in the early 60s and the Thank trial you. of of, uh, of John Schubert's second wife, the, the, the secret wife down in Florida and the kids that nobody knew about. That was all great stuff. So I made extensive use of your uh, 
of your uh, of your clips back in the days you know not, now kids today i always tell kids when they're doing research i say don't just depend on the internet you got to go to libraries because you're going to find a lot of stuff in newspapers that's not online and so much of your stuff joe was just in the uh, it was in the morgue of the new york post right. and when i got those envelopes i thought this is a gold mine it was great stuff just great stuff well, thank you michael we uh, we have a Solorian who's also a playwright, Kate McLeod, and uh, she has a couple of questions for you. Go ahead. Uh, Joe, uh, first of all, Joe, you had a question, though, didn't you? Yeah. How did you get into, into involved in theater as, as a career? Well, um, I was not something I ever thought I would do, and I was not going to be a journalist either. I mean, I was a history major at Columbia, and my intention was to go to law school. And uh, one summer, summer of my junior year, I guess, I wanted to stay in New York. I didn't want to go back to work in the, you know, the family sporting goods store in upstate New York. But my father said, well, if you want to stay in New York, you're going to have to figure out a way to pay for the dorm because I'm not going to pay for it this summer. You got to pay for it. So you got to find a job. And I went to the career services thing at Columbia and there was a posting for um, internship for Broadway producer Elizabeth McCann paid $250 a week that summer. So I applied for the job. And I got the job and my very first day on the job and Liz McCann, God love her. She produced the elephant man, Dracula, uh, three tall women mornings at seven. She just died last week. I went to her funeral. Um, and Liz was a crusty old character. My first day in the job, she was producing this play called Les Liaison Dangereuses from the Royal Shakespeare company. And she said, all right, kid, there's this actor in the play and put him in this cheap, apartment house and his air conditioning doesn't work. Go fix it. I was like, I don't know how to fix an air conditioning unit. But I went to the Black and Decker store on 8th Avenue and 42nd Street. I bought a screwdriver. So I looked, but I looked like I know what I was doing. I went to this apartment, knocked on the door and this, and I can only describe this man as elongated. He's very tall. And he was like, yes. I said, I'm here from Liz McCann's office to fix your air conditioning unit. He said, oh yes, it's beastly hot in here. Beastly, beastly hot. hot. And then I see this very attractive female calf sticking out from under the uh, sheets of his bed. And this woman with blonde hair takes the cover. Oh, it's so hot in here. so hot in here. Beastly, beastly hot. I just stuck the screwdriver and jiggled it around and the air conditioning worked. <laughs> it worked. It just it worked. And then I got out of there. That elongated man was one Alan Rickman making his Broadway debut in Les Liaisons Dangereuses. And the girl in the bed was Beatty Edney, who was the young ingenue that he was shacking up with. And that summer, I had so much fun working as an intern in Liz's office, running to the theater every night, hanging out with Alan Rickman. We became good friends, going backstage. And I thought, you know what? I don't know what this theater thing is. I don't know anything about it, but I never want to leave it. It is just too much fucking fun. <laughs> <clears throat> so I found a way to become a writer. You know, I'm not an actor. I'm not a director. I'm not a producer. But I, I guess I had a talent for uh, for writing about it. And, um, you know, I got a job at a little magazine called Theater Week right out of college. And I was there three years. And then I went to the Daily News and then the Post. And that's how it all began. But it was only because I was sent to fix Alan Rickman's air conditioning unit. So you, you can't, <laughs> Joe, you, you can't you can invent careers like like ours. It just it just kind of happens to you. When you review a play, when you go when you go on to review a play, um, what's on your checklist? Or do you really even have a checklist? What what do you what do you prioritize? What is it you're you're looking for principally to uh, be in that review? I want to go and see something that I've never seen before. Now that could be the opening number of The Lion King. It could be Vanessa Redgrave's performance in Long Days Journey and Tonight. It could be something as uh, fun as the Book of Mormon. It could be, you know, brilliant production of Coriolanus. But for me, it's got to be something that just absolutely startles me and grips me and holds my interest. I mean, I've been around the block a long time, so I can go see a lot of shows. And I say, oh, I know. Oh, I see what's going to happen. This is going to happen. And then next is going to happen. This, this is going to happen next. There's going to be a twist here. There'll be a little subplot here. The predictable in the theater to me is death. It is, it's what Hal Prince told me years ago. And I, I, I live by, this, I live by this, um, this rule, if you will. 
Hal Prince said, if you're in the theater, it's not enough to give people what they know. You have to give them something they did not even expect. And that's, that's the criterion I have every time I go to the theater. It has got to be something that you could not even have imagined until you were sitting there experiencing it right now. So, you know, I don't like, I don't like a lot of the movies made, the plays made from movies. A lot of them are predictable, but every now and then you get one like Hairspray, which was sensational based on a movie, but it was totally reinvented for the theater and was great fun. But it's, 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 it really is what Hal said. You've got to give people something they didn't even expect. Stephen Vrados asks, uh, well, actually, uh, notes a, a number of musicals that are uh, apparently coming to Broadway. Uh, he, he names Diana, Flying Over Sunset, Mrs. Doubtfire, MJ the Musical. He wonders if there's been any, you know, buzz on any of them or what what you may know and think about any of those. Well, of course, we haven't seen them yet, but um, I hear Mrs. Doubtfire is great fun. And uh, there was, during the pandemic, the cast of Mrs. Doubtfire put together a video of them all singing a song from the show. And uh, this was really at the height of things, you know, April 2020, where things were really, really bleak. But, and I'm not a sentimental guy by any stretch of the imagination, but this little montage of the song, I can't remember the name of the song now from Mrs. Doubtfire. It was so joyful so much fun we played it again and again on my radio show and we put it on our website and uh, it was just uh, it was just fl- it was just flooded just flooded i have a lot of hope for mrs doubtfire i think it'll be a fun show flying over sunset i'm very interested in written by my friend james lapine who did uh, sunday in the park with george and into the woods with steve sondheim and this is a, a musical about um the early days of lsd and the experimentation with lsd in california back in the, uh, in the 60s. So that's an interesting subject matter. And uh, I hear that's pretty good. MJ, the musical, I think that's a tricky one. I mean, I'm going to be curious to know how they deal with the issue of Michael Jackson's pedophilia. You know, everyone loves the Michael Jackson songs, but, you know, let's face it, as a human being, Michael Jackson would, you know, would have been canceled if he were still alive. Uh, he could very well wound up in jail. So I will be curious to know if the producers and the writers of the show have the guts to deal with the real Michael Jackson. If not, it's just going to be a Michael Jackson jukebox musical. And frankly, it won't have much interest for me. Bill Deal wants to know know if you think uh, think the New York Times critic still has the power to kill a show. No, not anymore. Those days are gone. Um, The Times is a uh, is an interesting place these days. It is a. it's the one of the wokest, if you will, institutions on the planet. And uh, the Times has decided that they're all in for Broadway is too white and not diverse enough. And I do know some of my older friends at the paper there, uh, some of whom are critics, basically have been told um, if the play is written by any kind of a minority, we are not going to pan it. You are not going to pan that play. Wow. So the Times is being very disingenuous right now oh. about a lot of things. And uh, some of those critics who, Joe, you would know some of those guys, um, you know, they're older guys and they're just clinging to their jobs and they're not going to do anything to rock the boat. So you're going to read a lot of reviews for shows that aren't that good. But if they tick all the boxes of diversity, you're going to be reading, reading great reviews from The New York Times. But at the end of the day, if these plays aren't really that good, the audience is not going to be there for it. They're not going to, it's the days of Frank Rich when Frank Rich could make or break a play. They're long, long gone. And there's a, there's a, frankly, I would say a kind of dishonesty going on at the times right now about certain things. I was looking at the theater directory in that paper that you just talked about, you know, this thing we all see every day and on the weekends, uh, much smaller, obviously, less than, than we're used to seeing. And there's one, drama on this as Broadway has only partly reopened. There may be more than one, but the one that stands out to me is To Kill a Mockingbird, which I think was doing well before the pandemic. But yeah. everything else is a, pretty much everything else is a musical. Uh, what do you make of that? There are a number of plays. Uh, there are a lot of plays uh, being written by 
uh, uh, African Americans because Broadway is very much caught up in the Black Lives Matter movement now, and Broadway's having its reckoning. And there are a lot of plays that are going to open, written by uh, black writers, and you know some are going to be good and some aren't going to be good. That's just the way it goes. I would say Lackawanna Blues by the wonderful Ruben Santiago Hudson. I saw that many years ago. He's a terrific performer, terrific writer and director. That'll be a good one. Um, some of the others, I've read some of the scripts and they're not, you know, they're B-level plays and we'll see if they survive. But uh, there are plays, I think you're wrong about that, Tony. There are definitely a lot of plays. There are eight or nine plays going to open. I'll tell you one thing that's great is the the Lehman trilogy. I saw it at the uh, at the Park Avenue Armory and uh, it's coming back to Broadway. It's coming to Broadway. And that is, that's a sensational play. Fascinating play about the Lehman Brothers. Glad to hear uh, about the plays that are coming. And yeah, I, I guess I overlooked it. Uh, Lackawanna Blues is open now, apparently only through the through, through the uh, end of the month. And um, the Lehman thing is, is also, I'm not sure what it's run. Let's see if it says it here. Uh, well, they say 99 performances only, but uh, those two, in addition to... Uh, Kill a Mockingbird are now open, uh, but I guess we all recognize that musicals are the are the big draw for for Broadway. And as it continues, good as it uh, continues to open, it's great to know there'll be more more dramatic plays. Before we finish, I wanted to ask him, Michael about his other life. You know, as a as a daily uh, talk show host. It's it's rather more political than anything that that we've said today, uh, yes. and 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 conservative on W O R. About putting that on Broadway, Michael, <laughs> or off Broadway. I'm an upstate New York guy, so you know I I was grew up as a Republican, and I'm an '80s kid, so you know Ronald Reagan was my president. Um, so I was never uh, I was never a liberal, but I guess you could call me more of sort of a an old fashioned term, more of a country club Republican. My congressman, when I was a kid and I worked in his office one summer, was the wonderful Barbara Conable. I don't know if you guys remember that. Oh, sure. Congressman Barbara Conable. Great guy. That was kind of the Republican world that I came from. And Len is kind of a moderate, middle of the road Democrat. But, you know, you can't have a talk show where everybody agrees on everything. It would be boring to say, you know, what do you think about this? I think this. I agree. You know, so Len and I have to have the yin and the yang and we have to kind of the fake fights about stuff. But, you know, our philosophy about it all, especially during the Trump time when things are so polarized, I guess they're still so po so polarized because Len and I come from different worlds. Len from sports, me from the theater. We're not that invested in politics. It doesn't it doesn't mean all that much to us. So we can have the debate, but our feeling has always been. You can have a knockdown, drag out fight over politics, but when the fight's over with, you want to go to a bar and have a drink and you're still friends. So that's kind of the attitude we took to uh, to the show. I mean, neither Len nor I are haters. I don't think, you know, I don't think AOC is a horrible person. I don't think Nancy Pelosi is a horrible person. Len actually thinks Donald Trump is a horrible person. Uh, but <laughs> And he hates Mitch McConnell too. <laughs> but, you know, our whole philosophy of the show is, Let's battle it out over some issue and then let's find a laugh to get out before we go to the commercial and we come back, we'll do something lighter. We'll do a little sports, we'll do a little entertainment. People just cannot, cannot take nonstop anger all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm, I know I'm worn out by it. I mean, I, 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 the end of the Trump years, I was just like, please, this thing has to end. I cannot take fights with friends and screaming matches and, uh, Life is too short to be angry all the time. Michael Riedel and Len Berman, W-O-R, 7 to 10 on the dial, 6 to 10 in the morning. 6 to 10 in the morning, boy, that must be hard. You know, well, it's terrible for a theater long. person like me. I never went to bed till 2 in the morning. I never got up before 11. Now I get up at 5.30 and I go to bed at 9. So my, my whole life has been turned upside down. I know those hours. Uh, you know those hours, Tony. You've done that. Yeah, it's not. not you know, it was my friend, my friend Mark Simone. He's at WOR. He's got the ten to twelve spot, and he got me. He got me the job in radio because he saw me uh, as a regular on Don Imus's program, and he said to the programming director at WOR, "I said I, I think this newspaper guy is pretty good on the radio. I'm gonna take a vacation, December four years ago." have him be the, have him fill in for me for that week. 
And what I did know was I was auditioning. I didn't know it. I just thought I was filling in, but I was auditioning. And then they offered me the morning job. And I was a little concerned about the future of newspapers. And I you know, realized that once upon a time, I was the youngest person in the features department of the Post. And now I was becoming the oldest person in the features department of the New York Post. And I thought sooner or later, they're going to come knocking on the door and here's the buyout. So I thought I better have a second act in my career. So I took the job as the morning show host and I took Simone out to lunch to thank him for getting me the job. And the very first thing he said to me, he said, oh, you're doing the mornings. That's great. It's going to take 10 years off your life. That's why I don't do mornings. <laughs> going back to the last line of your book, Michael, as you, as you quoted it to us before, Broadway is in the midst of a new golden age. From your page, from your lips, from your words to God's ear. Let's hope our God's ears. I, let's hope we can see another golden age of Broadway down the road. And thanks for spending this time with us this morning. A pleasure. A pleasure. Nice That's to see fun. you all. It's been great. Thank you very much. And again, to Joe Berger, I got to thank you, Joe. Without those great clips I found of yours covering those Schubert scandals back in the day, I would not have had my first book. So I hope you. I hope I gave you all the proper credit in the book because <laughs> I stole everything from you. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, Lorian, it's great. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. So, Lorians, I'll be sending you a message about our next event. Uh, so, look for that. Thanks, guys. Take care.